Hi friends, thank you for tuning in to the Concussion Coach Podcast. I'm Bethany Lewis, the Concussion Coach. I'm a neurological occupational therapist and certified life coach, and I specialize in guiding people through their concussion recovery journey. I am passionate about helping people understand their injury, speed up their recovery, and reclaim control over their life post-concussion. The purpose of this podcast is to help increase awareness of concussions and the impact they can have on a person's life, and to bring hope to people who have suffered a concussion and those who love them. I firmly believe that sharing stories and knowledge about concussions will bring important light and understanding to this misunderstood and often invisible injury. The information in this podcast is meant to bring that awareness and hope and is not meant as medical advice. The opinions shared are those of the interviewees and my own. If you are suffering with lingering concussion symptoms, I have created a concussion coaching program specifically for you. I will be your mentor to guide you through your recovery journey, offering help with understanding and managing your symptoms, setting achievable goals, and learning how to manage your own thoughts and nervous system in order to get control over your life again. If this program sounds like something that would help you or someone you love, sign up for a free consultation. In the consultation, you'll get valuable information and resources and gain hope for your future. Sign up for your free consultation at the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Hi friends, welcome back to the Concussion Coach Podcast. Today's interview is going to be slightly different from the other concussion story interviews because today we get to hear from the perspective of someone with a concussion and the caregiver of someone who has had a concussion. My guests today are new friends of mine. Heather is the mother and Evie is the daughter. Evie is the one who had the concussion and Heather and I met at the wedding of my brother-in-law and new sister-in-law. And um, she's one of my sister-in-law's best friends. And her name is Heather Rose. And she and I had so much fun playing together in the waves of Mexico (laughs) at this destination wedding. And while we were waiting for good waves to body surf, we had some really good conversations. And I discovered through the course of our discussions that her daughter had experienced post-concussion symptoms and had gone through her own recovery journey. So I thought it would be really interesting to hear a concussion story through the lens of the mother of a concussion survivor, as well as the person who had the concussion. And Heather and Evie were kind enough to agree to come on and share their experience. So thank you so much for being here, you guys. Thanks for having us, Bethany. We are excited to share the story and for the opportunity to help spread awareness. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Thank you. So tell us and either of you, uh, whoever wants to jump in first to share the experience, um, why don't you tell us what happened and how long ago it happened that the concussion occurred? The concussion happened May of my sophomore year. So going into junior year, the concussion was part of an ongoing condition I have called dysautonomia. It's an invisible illness, but basically dysautonomia is where my heart and brain don't communicate well. So my heart doesn't pump enough blood for my brain. And when it doesn't pump enough blood, my brain kind of hits a panic button, which causes me to pass out. So I, one morning I woke up, I had done a lot of things the few days before, and I didn't really think it would affect me. But I got out of bed, I was getting ready for the day, and all of a sudden, I I got really dizzy. And the next thing I remember, I was on the floor, and I thought I was paralyzed. Like, I couldn't feel my hands, I couldn't feel my feet, and, like, I couldn't feel anything below my neck. So I was lying on the floor, like, I'm pretty sure I'm paralyzed. And so... The rest is kind of a blur, but I somehow my parents got me to the hospital. And by the time I got to the hospital, I started like I had gained feeling in my extremities. And then I got to the hospital. They did an MRI scan and they told me that I had a minor concussion and just to take it easy. And I didn't really know the effects, how like how would it affect me later? But the long term effects ended up being pretty severe. Mm hmm. Yeah. Holy cow. So first of all, how old were you when this happened? Two years ago, I was so 15. 15. Yeah. I was, I just had my permit. Okay. So you were 15. And how long have you had the diagnosis of dysautonomia? I think I, I've had it pretty much all my life, but I was diagnosed with dysautonomia the year prior. So okay. when I was 14, 13, 14. Mm-hmm. That's really cool that you knew what was going on. I, I mean, I imagine it sounds like it took you a while to figure it out since you were 13 yeah. 14 when you figured it out, but good to know what was going on because that this mm-hmm. autonomy is something that often people who've had a concussion experience afterwards and it doesn't get talked about a lot. And um, yeah, it can be very disconcerting. So you, it's interesting that it kind of was the other way around. You had the dysautonomy at first and then the concussion. So how did I, let's hear a little bit from Heather's perspective. What happened? For, you got a call or 
your daughter called you and was like, Hey, I think I might be paralyzed. What was that like? Well, it's, it's just a normal day of getting up and getting ready. And I didn't hear any motion of anyone getting ready. So I thought, Oh, that's odd. Like my daughter's usually up and at him and getting ready. And so I went down to check on her and the, I was only able to open the door slightly. And I hear this little voice saying, mom, don't open the door. I'm right on the other side and don't move me. I think I might be paralyzed. And so I said, okay. And I knew that she already has high frequency of feeling dizzy, but actually passing out, blacking out, hitting her head. That's always a worst case scenario. And, but that's something that we keep our eye open and that we're concerned about because it's, you know, whether it's, in the house or out and about the falling down and can you hit your head? That is something that we're concerned about. And then the fact that it happened, we're like, okay, well, just don't move. Thanks for letting us know. And then immediately called our local hospital and it was a friend who picked up and they were able to tell us what we needed to do to get her in. And I think after the MRI, when they're like, oh, this is just a minor concussion, just take it easy. We're like, oh, so she's going to be fine in a few days. (laughs) That was just the expectation. Yes. Yep. That's a totally understandable expectation there. And so had you not had, had you not had a lot of experiences where you'd actually pass out? It was just like, you felt dizzy and then you knew to sit down or how, how does that usually play out? I think I had actually passed out like four to five times before the time I passed out and got a concussion, but normally it was just feeling dizzy and then like having brain fog and then like, like recovering from that. But it wasn't Typically, your body has given you enough warning where you yeah. know you're not feeling well, you sit down, you don't move. But mm-hmm. I think um, that particular morning, you popped up getting ready for <laughs> the day yeah. and went down so fast that okay. you didn't know where you hit. And we didn't know. Yeah, where you we, hit. we still don't know. I think the guess is the doorknob. Yeah. A shelf, something. Mm-hmm. But yeah, mm-hmm. now in the room, we were like, okay, where are the sharp corners? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> padding over everything. <laughs> okay, super interesting. So what, and I love that you brought up the fact that you were told it was a mild concussion. And so you expect that, did they give you any, and I'm not trying to like throw anybody under the bus here. I just want to know what was your experience? Did they, did they tell you what to expect or like what could happen with a concussion or was it just like, oh yeah, you'll be fine kind of thing. It was, yeah, it was like, oh, since it's mild, you'll be fine. Just take it easy. And so that was kind of like our expectations going into it. Whereas if I take it easy, then I should be good. So then what, how did, how long did it take <laughs> to figure out that it wasn't, that wasn't how it was going to play out? <laughs> I think it started subtly where I think I just started getting really bad migraines. I couldn't remember things well, sounds, textures, smells, lights, like overstimulated me really bad. I was, I got more stressed out easily, just a bunch, like everything started adding up. And then we were like, Oh, I bet this is because of the concussion. Like, I bet it's a long-term effect. Cause it was, it was a long time. Like I started getting like migraines and then everything kind of added up where I think six months later, I we were like, this must be because of the concussion. Mm -hmm. That's impressive that you were able to put those, yeah, two and two together there. Cause it, it can, come on slowly and like one thing at a time here and there. And, and often I think it gets overlooked like, Oh, what? So was there any one particular thing that you were like, okay, what is happening? Or was it just kind of the buildup of all of it? I think it was mainly the buildup of all of it. The migraines were really hard because I couldn't look at a screen, which without getting a migraine or without feeling like really drained. And that was a majority of schoolwork. And then brain fog was pretty heavy where like I feel like I couldn't drive in the mornings and then I've always been like academically things have pretty come easy and so when things started to be really hard it was just like a sign that something was off mm-hmm. and then feeling crabby all the time or just like overstressed because of all the like I just felt overstimulated because of all the different like things that were just not usually stressful to me before I think that was a sign that like something was off Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The yeah. context has happened in May. And so we had the summertime and even during the summer where she wasn't like straining herself mentally, um, but just going on hikes and things that were like easy family hikes, things that the, her younger brother could easily do. Um, it was just really apparent like, oh, 
like this is hard. <laughs> mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. things that were not be- hard before <laughs> suddenly. Yeah. Yes. Did you feel like the dysautonomia got worse or did that get impacted? It definitely got worse. I think that's what we initially thought it was. We thought my dysaut- dysautonomia was getting worse because like hiking was such a struggle because I'd be so tired and like fatigued. And then I got dizzy more often, I think, where I wouldn't like pass out, but my level of dizziness definitely increased. Yes. Did you, other than the light being an issue, did you notice any issues with your eyes? Yeah, that's where I mainly got my migraines, like right behind my eyes, where they would just pound. And I feel like like the only thing I could do was like sleep, to sleep the migraines out. Okay. And did you have issues with sleep? Was sleep affected for you? slightly like going to sleep with a migraine was rough but as soon as I was asleep I woke up feeling better okay that's good I'm glad so if you got a migraine at two o'clock you would want to go to bed because you knew that was the one way to like reset your your head and so if you got a migraine early in the day you're just like I just need to take a nap I just need to go to bed Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I was like I've never seen that before (laughs) Oh man. So were you able to continue in school if so much of it was online or with screen? Um, a lot of my teachers had to just be really understanding. Like if certain assignments were done online, like I couldn't do them. So I'd have to like compromise with my teachers and be like, can I have this printed out on paper? Or sometimes I would just like suffer through it. But it was it was definitely interesting. <laughs> Academically, it was interesting. So Evelyn is just to paint the picture of what she was like before academically things always came very easily and to the point where not only was she doing high school she was also pursuing her AA and a lot of it through online classes and um, taking tests and things like that and I think sorry what is AA her associate's degree okay okay and so she was doing that simultaneously while she was in high school and it was probably two months after your concussion Mm -hmm. and Evelyn was like, what's that thing when a friend, when a person is supportive and they care for each other, what's that word? And I said, are you looking for the word friend? She's like, that's it. And I thought, oh no, (laughs) like what if, what if she doesn't get her brain back? (laughs) But yes, the word finding is a real concern and would be, I could see that being very distressing for mom. (laughs) Too, right? Like, oh my gosh, what's happening here? Yes. So how much prior to this experience, how much did you know about concussions? Nothing. <laughs> like yeah. it was to the point where I think the day after there, well, like, like take it easy. Um, maybe like don't fall asleep right away just in case. And so <laughs> I didn't realize like you couldn't like, you know, not watch TV right after a concussion. And so I think my dad and I stayed up the whole night, like watching TV. <laughs> Which definitely did not help things. That, that's so, what taking it easy means, right? Like that. Yeah, like, I didn't, you know, that. <laughs> and then you aren't supposed to read. And for the first week of taking it easy, I read like 24 seven because I love to read. So you didn't move. You yeah, like, stayed on I, the couch. <laughs> yeah. So I just didn't know. Yeah. We just didn't really know anything about concussions or. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's really, that's very interesting. And a good point that take it easy usually means yeah lay on the couch and watch something read something whatever and that yeah. can be, that can aggravate symptoms of a concussion for sure mm-hmm. yeah. <laughs> i know <laughs> so did you notice any concerns with reading itself like was it hard to remember what you were reading or hard to stay on the line that you were reading or did it I just give you headaches i think before reading was it was just i i love reading so reading was always something that I really enjoyed and I still do love it but whenever I read like it would start to get blurry and then I would get really bad migraines behind my eyes and same would happen for like watching tv so yeah okay and this is something that I think comes up a lot of times when a teenager has had a concussion it like you said you were more irritable like everything you were so overwhelmed that just things felt overwhelming and you couldn't Mm -hmm. handle it right like is that something at the beginning, was that, were you guys 
thinking that was maybe just a teenage thing or hormones or something? Or did you, were you able to tell right away, like, oh no, this is actually probably from the concussion? We definitely knew that it's like her inherent personality. She's so laid back and uh, just a go with the flow person, allergic to drama. Like that's, those are all the things that we would use to describe Evelyn beforehand, just never made a fuss over anything. And then, and just really even keel. And so, and, and high capacity and, and just everything just came easily and you were able to accomplish a lot. And then after a day of school and then sports and then going to work, like these were all things that you could do easily, but you would be in tears at the end of the day I remember that. <laughs> and just hearing a lot of talk that was actually fairly concerning. So I'm not sure if you want to share about that. Like, <laughs> um, I think in that season, I was just so like, I just felt really stressed out and overwhelmed and I didn't necessarily know why. <laughs> I think I told my mom at one point, I was like, you know, it'd be really nice. Like my biggest dream at this point is to just go into a coma and never wake up. <laughs> oh goodness. Like, just forget all of life stress. Yeah. I so, think like you're just wanting a break. You're yeah. just wanting like a, a rest. <laughs> yeah. So I was never like, super depressed I think I was just like very overwhelmed and very stressed out and with things that I like nece- like I wasn't stressed out with before yep yes thank you for sharing that I think it's important again for people to hear all of this because it just I was actually talking to someone today a good friend of mine who had a concussion and has been listening to the people's stories from the podcast and she's like it it's just very validating <laughs> to recognize you're not you're not crazy it's not it's not just you like this is a real thing that happens from this injury it's it's not unusual so so thank you for sharing that so was there anything in particular that and maybe this is a question I should be asking <laughs> later but was there anything about your experience of a concussion that surprised you that was like totally not what you would have thought a concussion would include i just think Because a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, I got a concussion doing this. Oh, I got a concussion doing this. And it never seems like a huge deal. I didn't realize like how much like it just impacted my life so much for a long period of time that I didn't realize like a concussion could do that in a sense, like leave like really like harmful lasting effects where I thought I would get a concussion and my head would hurt and then it would go away. Mm -hmm. I think the question of like, is she permanently altered? Yeah, that was scary. Or diminished in any way was truly one that was frightening because Mm -hmm. here she was um, just super high achieving and capable and can do anything and tackle everything and super even keel to, and and we're training her to become more independent. We're imagining what life will look like once she leaves the house, she's getting her permit and, you know, suddenly she's not up for driving and she's not sure she can or should drive. After a long day, um, her brother's whistling is just like ready to put her over the edge. And she's not mad. She's just done. She's overwhelmed. Um, lingering in family conversations, like the capacity to, to stay and problem solve was a little bit less. Mm-hmm. And just that question of like, oh, is this, is this what life is going to be like for her mm-hmm. forever? <laughs> That yeah. was sobering. <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Those were such, such good points. Thank you. And, and again, things that I don't think get talked about is because yeah, we hear all the time. Yeah. I had a concussion and like people, what you were expecting, like I was fine in a couple of days like that. We don't, people don't recognize that this is, can be a really long lasting thing and very affecting and, and scary <laughs> because what does it mean for the future? But again, part of the point of this podcast is to let people know that healing is possible and to give that hope. And so, and I love a lot of, so far, a lot of the um, interviews that I have done have been with people who've gone to the clinic that I work at. And so I'm excited to have another perspective. <laughs> you guys did not go to the clinic that I work at <laughs> and you have found good healing. So this is good news. So tell us how did the injury affect the people closest to you? And I know we've got, we're getting mom's perspective, which is really important, but siblings, dad, friends, how did your social interactions change? I think my friends were really understanding where I, I could say before I, I have a little bit of FOMO. So I just said yes to like everything and I never wanted to miss out. And so I think how it affected people around me, like mainly my friends, they just were so understanding where I could be like, I'm sorry, but like, I can't do this today. 
or like if you want to have a movie night like I can't come because I can't like I it's just gonna make my head hurt so like I can't do that and I think my siblings had to be really understanding too just because they got like at the end of the day they got all like the doneness and overwhelm so yeah (laughs) that that does make sense Um, (laughs) families families are the ones that get the brunt of it a lot of times <laughs> in general. So what treatments or therapies did you try and have you found to be the most helpful? So I went to concussion therapy in Durango and I had this doctor named Luke Angel and he kind of did like a three, a three-way method to come like help the concussion. And the first was through dry needling, which is kind of like acupuncture but the needles go deeper in your head and he would stick them like all over the base of my scalp. And then he would hook up little wires to them and like shock my head, which was supposed to relieve like muscle muscle tension. So that really helped. And then he would adjust my neck, I think every other visit or every visit, depending on if I needed it. And then thirdly, he had me do like PT exercises again, because I think I hit right here. So he had me do a lot of PT exercises to help me relieve tension just from right back here. In the right, in the back of your head there. Uh Uh-huh. And then he suggested that I get a doth piercing, which it's it's this piercing like inside of here. And it supposedly, it doesn't work for everybody, but it supposedly like pinches a pressure point, which relieves tension on the side of my head, which is where I got most of my migraines. And that has been really helpful. Those four things have been really, really helpful. I don't go to concussion therapy anymore, but I have the doc and I still do some PT exercises. Okay. So I'm going to ask you some more questions about this. So <laughs> I, for the people who are listening, just because they can't see where you're at, you were pinching. It's like the piercing is kind of on the part of your ear. That's the cartilage. Yeah. yeah the cartilage, cartilage inside right. your ear that like bunches up on the inside. <laughs> so <laughs> Okay. Actually, I thought this is a good. <laughs> okay. I was like, yeah. I just so and does that so you he was helping with the the migraines mostly with that that's what that was for Mm -hmm. yeah migraines it really yeah it really helped so and so how far after like was it at about six months when you realized oh this is post-concussion stuff yes you found him you looked him up yeah, uh, actually, this was really cool. We would just went in for a well child check mm-hmm. and the same doctor who was amazingly persistent about knowing that something was off with Evelyn when she was a child. And she was so consistent with saying, what testing haven't we done? What haven't we tried? What are we going to do? And so she was the one who helped her find the diagnosis through a children's uh, hospital reference referral. And um, she found that referral, which eventually got her diagnosed for dysautonomia. And then when we were talking, yes, we she had hit her head, but then she's dealing with these constant migraines. And she said, you know, that could be post-concussion. Let me refer you over to a um, sports concussion therapist. And we said, really, at six months out, there's you can change that. There's, there's work to be done. We didn't miss a window. And she says, no, let me just go ahead and refer you and uh, let's see what he can do. And I was shocked because I thought, wow, like six months out, you can still do something. And he was incredible. And it was, it really turned uh, the story around for Evelyn for sure. Yeah. Oh, that's so great. Oh, I love that. Hallelujah for people who know (laughs) what to do. (laughs) where to direct you that's awesome and tell me again what is the name of this guy and his clinic um his name is luke angel and what's the name of his clinic again i think it's just durango it's a, medical it's a sports concussion yeah. therapy and found in durango mm-hmm. well, awesome well if you want we can link that in the show notes in case anybody listens from colorado and <laughs> wants to yeah. look him up because yeah i think that would be when i get the word out there for people to yeah know where to go so what things well and I guess I'll ask this too how long were you in treatment with him and how long did before you started feeling effects from it how long was I in treatment with him for it was probably another six six months yeah I was gonna say (laughs) yeah so another six months and then I think I started like noticing results it wasn't like immediate but I definitely started noticing results about like one to two months in 
And then from there, like the difference was crazy. Like it felt like my life had just turned around because I went from like having migraines every day and like, like being confused on a lot of things and being like overstimulated and tired to having like migraines, maybe like once a month to none at all to um, like having more mental clarity to like realizing like I, I think migraines too took a lot of energy out of me. So once they stopped happening, I could have a lot of energy for other things. And I stopped being overstimulated because when things were overstimulating, I just got a migraine. So like all your sensory, all my sensory, sensory stuff started. went down and I had <laughs> a lot more energy and mental clarity. So it, it was a huge impact. Oh, that's so awesome. Did, how many times a week did you see him? Once a week. It was once a week for the first couple months. And then he started spacing out his appointments. And that was really encouraging. He would give her homework and uh, she would do her PT. And it was really incredible to see the progress. And you saw his confidence because he started spacing out those appointments and making them less frequently. Mm -hmm. And then she graduated. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that is so good. So through this process, what would you say were some of the things that were most helpful in discovering and loving yourself post-concussion? I think before I, because I was so go with the flow, I didn't know how to set good boundaries, like say no to things. And I didn't really know how to listen to my body. And so like, I would just push through stuff because, and like, I didn't want to ask for help and I didn't want to be a burden. And so obviously not good messages. So I think when I wasn't able to do things and I had to ask for help because there was no other option, it like really forced me to be like, oh, like asking for help isn't a bad thing. I'm not a burden and just kind of like learn. Yeah, learn to say no, learn to like know when my body is done, like I can't push past that because then it's going to be more like harmful than good. Mm -hmm. So yeah. We talk about FOMO, like the fear of missing out and the the desire to say yes to every opportunity, every fun thing, every visit with every friend. And you want to show up to be there for everybody else too. Mm-hmm. And to do all the things, your involvement at school is high, academics, uh, sport, uh, dance, <laughs> church, it goes on and on. And so to know that you have limits. Uh, I think was a good message. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. That, and that can be a hard, a hard thing for people to go through. I think a lot of times that, that change of realizing that there are limits or that it's, things are different now that can be yeah. really challenging. So mm-hmm. um, thanks for sharing that. What did other people say or do that was most helpful for you through this period? I think I had good days and I had bad days. And I think before I was like always on, like everybody saw me on good pages. And so I think when people like gave me permission to be like, it's okay. Like you're having a bad day. It happens. And like, I'm here, I'm like here for you. But, and like the whole, like, you're not a burden message was very, was very impactful, but like the permission to not always like achieve or perform at a hundred percent was definitely beneficial for me. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. And Heather, on your end, was there, did people know what you were going through with this? Like what was, what was helpful for you going through this process? My husband was a hundred percent supportive and that was really, really nice. I think what could have been a very scary time of, oh no, do we have the confidence to know what the future will bring? I think that was a thought that crossed my head, but he really helped us not stay there. And so the the present of what's happening right now, um, he was big on like, well, if she's getting overwhelmed at work, why is she working three nights a week? <laughs> Let's just whittle that down. She doesn't have to do that. And, you know, he was just really wise in helping us make a lot of decisions and so supportive too. We live an hour away from where her therapy was. And so just even the gas money of driving out there and the whole day that it would take us. And he was like, he always gave us permission to be like, well, let's make it special. Go have a girl's day, go get coffee afterwards. And it was an incredible time for Mm -hmm. us to bond and like make it really fun. It's like something we anticipated. 
mm-hmm. and look forward to because it was draining for her to show up and do the work at dry needling. It would exhaust her, but it also was something that we started looking forward to. So as like time together as a yeah. mom and daughter. And I think because we were supported well at home where my husband, you know, made sure that he was taking care of the other kids and just, you know, even like not worrying about it financially of like, yeah, let's, you know, it's okay to spend that money on gas and on coffee or whatever else you guys want to do. It was, it was kind of a neat time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was like, I remember, yeah, I remember never being like, oh, like I have to go to commercial therapy. It was always like, oh, like I get to go. And I get to do concussion therapy, but then it's like a time with mom afterwards and driving there too. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh, I love that so much. You guys, that's the sweetest. That's really, really, really beautiful and a, and a great perspective. I am happy that people will get to hear that. I, I love that. Thank you for sharing that. So what, what advice would you give to people who are loving and supporting people with concussions? So this is kind of goes along with what we were just talking about. Um, sounds like loving, giving permission to have a, a bad day, even for the supporter. Right. Um, and mm-hmm. anything else that you think would be helpful for the people who are the, the caregivers, the ones who are supporting? I think, you know, your question earlier, like, Hey, is this just a teenage thing or is this connected to the concussion before? Like, like you were never, you were just so stable. You're never a moody child and every child is allowed to have emotions and big ones. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And I think you were just really regulated. But I think as a parent, like if a child is struggling with sudden anxiety or depression, I had no clue until literally we started researching like post-concussion stuff. That could be a result. Like we just had zero clue. We thought like headaches and maybe nausea were the only things to look out for. Mm -hmm. We didn't know that it could affect reading and memory and balance and moods and anxiety, depression, any of that. Like we just didn't know. We weren't educated at all about it. Yeah. I think just awareness, um, empathy to be like, oh, this this struggle with anxiety or depression or certain thoughts is just something good to be aware of. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that. So if you could go back in time, what advice would you give to yourself in the early days of this whole experience? Um, I think, I think I really struggled with the whole, how do I, like, how do I say yes to one thing? How do I say no to one thing? And I, I really did like push past what my limit was because I just, like, I didn't really want to hear that from my body. Like, and I would just want to do the thing. And so I'd be like, oh, it's whatever. I'll just like recover tomorrow or I'll recover the next day. And so I didn't really give myself time to recover or if I was feeling bad, I would just like ignore it until I could rest, like until there was time slotted to rest. So if I was going to go back and give like me personally advice, it'd be, you know, like actually do listen to your body. Like if it's, if I'm overwhelmed or overstimulated or like if I'm hurting, then to rest then instead of being, like, oh, I'll rest in three days. Cause I know that day we'll, we'll have time to rest. Um, and knowing that I can say no, like be like, oh, I could say yes to this, but no to this. Yeah. So that's something I learned along the way, but if I was to give myself advice, it would be that <laughs> in the beginning. <laughs> yes. That is, oh, like I, I want to like shout that from the rooftops. <laughs> Everybody listen to me right now. <laughs> like that is key. <laughs> so important and such good awareness and knowledge to have gained. I thank you for sharing that. How about you, Heather? Anything that you would tell yourself or her going back in time? We're definitely people that like to put a lot on the schedule and probably over schedule uh, with events and activities and even academically just be like, oh, let's take all those hard classes. That sounds great. <laughs> um, so yeah, being able to advocate a little bit better for the things that come up in the moment and say, you know what, what is, what I'm experiencing, even if no one can see it actually trumps what we have on the calendar. So I think I'm just supporting your message. Um, and it's, it's a tough one <laughs> because we're, we're ruled by our calendars and obligation and not wanting to let anyone or any, anybody down. But when in reality, your body's giving you signals all the time. So um, being kind to yourself and um, saying, 
like I, I really learned to respect those cues of, and of saying, wow, she's, she's overwhelmed or whatever it is. Let's pause. Yes. Even if it wasn't in the calendar. <laughs> <laughs> Even if it wasn't in the calendar, that uh, that's such a good point and one that I can personally relate to a lot. Um, and what you said, something that you said really uh, triggered a thought for me that, you know, we say we don't want to let anybody else down. And I think that can be something that comes up for people a lot is I, I the, the social obligation or like I feel you, you don't want to burden other people in quotes, right? Like there's a lot of worry about how other people are going to experience your injury. And helping people to recognize that that's not your responsibility. Like you're not responsible for how other people's are, how other people are reacting to what you are dealing with. And that message could get out there. I think that would be really helpful for people too, because yeah. we, we tend to push ourselves past our limits because we're worried about other people and not that we don't care about other people, but like you were saying, like we need to pay attention to our bodies so that then we have the capacity to do more other later as well. But yeah. yeah, really, really important. Thank you for sharing that. So how are you doing today? Are there things that you're still dealing with? What what keeps you going? I feel like I've mostly recovered. I don't struggle with migraines anymore. Um, just the occasional headache, but like any normal person, most of my, I feel like my mental clarity has mostly come back. If anything, I, well, I don't feel overstimulated anymore. If anything, I would just say I get more tired. Like, um, tiredness is more like prevalent than it was before, but I know how to manage it now. And so it's not, it's not like life changing or whatever. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's a, that's a big deal. Knowing how to handle the things when they do come up. Mm -hmm. I think that sounds, yeah, you sounds like you've gained a a really important depth of knowledge here. (laughs) Um, and I'm curious, is there any, like, how, when you say you want to listen to your body, are there any things that you would be able to tell other people of how to listen to their bodies? Like, what do you do to recognize and then respond to your body's, what it's trying to tell you? I think I struggled a lot with anxiety um, as part of like the post-concussion thing and just feeling like super stressed about everything and overwhelmed. And I think as soon as I was feeling like super overwhelmed or really anxious I would just like give a pause and be like okay like why am I feeling this way is is it a valid reason to be like stressed about or am I just you know anxious like over nothing kind of and then like more physical cues like if my head was starting to throb I'd be like okay like now's probably a time to go shut my eyes or take a break from the screen or take from reading or dizziness again just electrolytes water so and even paying attention to something like irritation. Yeah. I think irritation of like, oh, that little noise is bothering me or those lights are bothering me. So mm-hmm. instead of him being like, man, I'm a crummy person for being irritated. It's oh, my body's trying to tell me something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I need a break. I need to catch my breath. I, I can't do this right now was a, was almost a good cue to hear. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's such a, Good point. Thank you. Yeah. So good. So we've shared, I think you've shared a few of these, but are there other lessons that you've learned through this experience that you, yeah, wisdom you've gained? Spiritually, I have kind of always been the person just, I love Jesus, obviously, but I think I always tried to do everything on my own. Like I was pretty self-reliant just because I don't know if that's, that's the way you had to be. And so when I couldn't be self-reliant, it forced me to like rely on others more and rely on God in a big way because um, like obviously being anxious all the time, like that's not something I wanted to be, (laughs) but um, I was. So for me, when I was super anxious, I would take a break and pray to God and be like, okay, like I'm giving you this. And like he he's shown up in my life in a big way. I think because, um, I stopped being so self-reliant and I relied more on him. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. Sorry. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about that. Yeah. Calling on that higher power is a big deal. <laughs> and, and I think that's, I'm with you. I, I'm, I'm a Jesus lover as well, <laughs> but anybody, you know, anybody listening, whoever, whatever their higher power is like, that's, this is a good time to call on it and access that 
because it's the power is there for you and the strength and the comfort, all of that. It's real. Anything from your side, Heather, that you want to share things that you've learned? Um, I th- I've seen a big shift in identity. And so I actually want Evie to answer that because <laughs> like that identity piece was really, really huge because as she's my firstborn, she's always been a go-getter. She, I think she's always wanted to make life very easy for us. <laughs> and so I'm not sure somewhere or other that message of I, I have to be perfect and I have to make life easy for everybody else. And so that message, I hope, has really started to shift. I mean, kind of through a bad circumstance, but I've seen her identity shift in some ways. Mm-hmm. Before my identity was wrapped up in performance, um, in sports and academics and like being a good person. Uh, quote unquote. And so when I couldn't perform well, I like my self worth started to really tank because I couldn't perform as well academically. I like, you know, snapped at my siblings more. I wasn't always the best like daughter, which is like not true, but in my mind, that was very true. Um, and so because I couldn't have my identity like be how well I performed like it had to shift to something else. And so for me, it shifted to being like, okay, well, like if I can't perform well, then am I really of value? And so for me, it shifted to kind of the the basics and where like I realized my value didn't come from how I performed or like how good I was or... Um, what mood you're in. Yeah, what mood I was in, <laughs> like that that didn't hold my value. But for me, like knowing that, um, I was loved by God, I like am worthy. I am valuable, like just as a person in my own thoughts and my opinions. Um, that was really powerful for me. Thank you so much for sharing that. I, again, I was having this conversation with a friend of mine today and she was, she shared a few of the things that were really, that she was struggling with. And she was like, I was asking her, you know, okay, what is it? What are you making it mean? What is it? what's the underlying thing here? And she's like, oh, it all comes down to identity. <laughs> she like said, she's like, I know it's that, <laughs> but, but this is, I, you're hitting on something that is key and core. And was, I was reminded of just this morning that that's, you know, when we feel like we've lost what we can do, then it, it comes to who we are like, and, and recognizing that we are and who we, like just being gives us worth and value. Like we are already loved and worthy and valuable and And sometimes when we get that, like what we can do stripped away, (laughs) like that's when we realize it. It's, that's that's key. And And if I can add to that, like, because that has shifted, her identity is just of of how she sees herself. All of a sudden qualities that have been laying dormant in my daughter has, have come alive in great ways. She's able to advocate for herself. She has a voice. She's not afraid of asking for help. And so that, that question that I had two years ago is, and uh, is she ready to be launched? <laughs> Can she be an independent person? And the answer is yes, because those are skills to be able to know your limits, to ask for help, to know your worth, to know that you don't have to say yes to every fun opportunity that comes your way, that you can entrust in the inherent goodness of life, that there's there's good out there. And sometimes the answer is wait. And th- all those things have been good gifts for her and good gifts for me to know like, yes, I've got confidence. This, these are all the skills she needs. She's going to be great. <laughs> Oh my gosh, I love that. I love that so, so much. That is really, really powerful. And such a good example of how something that initially probably felt like this terrible, horrible thing that you don't want to do is mm-hmm. like turning out to be a, an amazing it, blessing in a lot of ways. And that's, a, I think, again, a message that is important to get out there because it can feel so not like a blessing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yes. Yeah. <laughs> it's very well disguised. <laughs> These blessings mm-hmm. sometimes. So that's really, really powerful. Thank you for sharing those those thoughts and insights. So or how have you maintained hope through your recovery journey? Maybe you've touched on this a little bit, but is there anything in particular that really helped you when you were in those hard times and when you weren't sure what was going to happen? Like, how did you maintain hope? Um, I think I had good days and 
bad days with hope as well. Some days it was really easy to be like, oh no, like I will get through this. I know other people have gotten through this. Especially when I started to see Luke Angel, it was like, okay, like he says that I can get through this. So like, I'll be able to, like there's hope. On days that I was feeling really rough where I was like having a migraine and I still had to be in school and there was all these other commitments and I was just really overwhelmed. It was hard to feel like there would ever be a life without all these symptoms. Like, and so I think for me, just reminders that like what I was feeling in the moment wouldn't be my forever. Give me hope. Mm. But some days it was really hard to find that reminder. <laughs> yeah. So that's a, an important message to get out there too. Thank you for sharing that. Anything you want to add to that, Heather? We used to be in perfect health. <laughs> until a few years back. And then my daughter uh, got to see me do have my own health struggles with some autoimmune things. And uh, I'm very, I'm, I'm high functioning now, but that story was a long one. And um, I think if I were to judge my story in the middle of like the worst days where the pain was insufferable, um, that would be really rough. But I think even Evelyn, you know, her being younger, when I went through my story, it was probably helpful to know, like, those those bad days don't have to define you. Mm-hmm. Like, you do need to, like, survive those bad days. And but we don't judge our stories by whatever page we're on. Like, God writes long stories. And so we don't know where we're at in that particular story. So it's okay to struggle. And we just have to like hang on during that. Like sometimes that's all you can do. And then um, I think the being proactive, having yes. doing anything where you feel like you're working towards a solution, even if it's like actively choosing to rest, <laughs> feels yeah. like it's something. Mm-hmm. Yes. <laughs> oh, such a good point. I, yes. Amen to that. I love that. Thank you. You guys, this has been such a good conversation. I really love and appreciate your perspective and everything that you shared. Is there anything else that you want people to know about concussions or your experience or just what message do you want to share with the world? (laughs) I think pay attention. We didn't have a, I'm not one to Google in symptoms and (laughs) worry and that not worrying could come with a drawback. Like I, we just were not really well informed. And so knowing that there are concussion specialists out there and that the brain can heal and that the body can heal. And, but to pay attention, if, if you know, something's not right and something's not normal, you don't have to just be like, oh, well, I guess that's the way it is that there is um, hope and, but you have to know your own body well enough, first of all, to have that baseline. And so I think what was great was having a provider that Mm -hmm. knew Evelyn for years and just a great uh, family provider who said, that's not right. (laughs) Let's, Let's look into that. Let's ask some more questions and let's get you to a specialist and let's get help that was a game changer mm-hmm. and um, the the level of knowledge and all the approaches he had was phenomenal for us. Yes. So pay attention to your own body, know your own body, pay attention to things like, Hey, I've never been annoyed by this before. That could be your body trying to talk to you. Mm-hmm. Something like that. So good. Yes. Thank you. Anything else, Evie? I think because I've had dysautonomia and then I went through this, like the concussion story and both were really hard but both were kind of invisible because from the outside when people would see me, like I would look happy and healthy until I wasn't. And it was really, sometimes it was really hard for people to like figure out like, is she being dramatic is like what's going on because you were just okay. Mm -hmm. And so for me, it's taught me just to be empathetic of people's stories because like, I think everybody has, invisible stories or stuff going on that not everybody knows where if they seem okay, like one day, but then not okay the next, like to have empathy for that and understanding. Oh, so beautiful. And the the invisible nature of this injury does make that so hard. And I love that you are so wise. <laughs> I'm so impressed. Like that's, that's one of the takeaways that you got was to have that empathy and compassion for other people. Cause you don't know what invisible things they're dealing with. That's, that's, very significant. Um, and I think on that point, people, I hear a lot of times people say, you know, other people were asking them, you know, what's going on for you? Are you being dramatic? But they were also questioning that in themselves. Like, am I being dramatic? Am I just crazy? Or like 
questioning whether <laughs> what is real for them too. So yeah, kind of what Heather was saying, trust your body, pay attention to it, notice what's going on. And, and don't think that this has to be your new normal. Cause sometimes people are told that too. So um, yeah, fight, fight for your body and pay attention to it and recognize that other people are maybe going through invisible things too. So those are beautiful lessons. You guys, this is so good. Thank you very, very much for sharing your experience and your wisdom <laughs> that has been hard earned here, but yeah, I really appreciate it. And um, hope that we can get this, this message out to people. It needs to be heard. <laughs> Thank you for all the work that you do with concussions. And it just made my heart so glad to know that you're going to be one of those game changers for someone else where you're like, this was my life. I thought it was here until. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. we're just really excited and hopeful for other people going through this and knowing that there there is a turning point for people's stories. And uh, it's not until they're willing to get help or get pointed to help. And it's exciting to know that you're going to be helping other people through this. So thank you. I'm so glad you listened in today. I hope you have gained some helpful insights and inspiration regarding dealing with and recovering from concussions. My goal is to create more awareness and education about concussions and the fact that there is so much that can be done to improve life after someone has had one. Help me spread the message by liking, commenting, rating, and subscribing to this podcast and share it with others who would benefit from hearing it. There are more resources available on my website. And again, if you or someone you love would benefit from concussion coaching, sign up for a free consultation using the link in the show notes or at my website, www.theconcussioncoach.com. Thank you. See you next time and take good care of that amazing brain of yours.